Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Kirsten Marti and I'm the Manager of Education and Community Engagement Programs at Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight for this talk with Alyssa Waters, um, followed by a Q&A with all of you. Admission for this program is pay as you wish. If you'd like to do make a donation to support this and future programs, you can do so at brattleboromuseum.org slash support, and you'll find information about membership there as well. Um, and May is membership month, so there's a lot of, this is a great time to join if you're interested. Um, this event is presented in connection with the exhibit Louisa Chase Fantasy Worlds, which is on view at BMAC through June 12th. Um, and we also have a catalog available for the BMAC gift shop. Um, there's a blog post for the exhibit if you're interested in learning more information. And there's also a virtual tour on our website in case you're not able to visit in person. And I'll put links for all those things in the chat in just a little bit. Um, for tonight, Alyssa will talk about Louisa Chase's work and the exhibit, and we'll finish with a Q&A. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you're welcome to do so at any time, and we'll save time um, at the end of the program for the questions. Um, if you're here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A function or the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment box, and we'll keep an eye on that as well. Um, so now I'd like to ask Alyssa to turn on her camera and microphone while I introduce her. Um, so Alyssa Waters served as a guest curator at the Williams College Museum of Art and as the Florence B. Selden Fellow at the Department of Prints and Drawings at the Yale University Art Gallery. She is a PhD student in art history at the University of Southern California, and she holds a BA from Dartmouth College and an MA in art history from Williams College and the Clark Art Institute. And previously she curated the BMAC exhibit, Natalie Frank Painting with Paper, which was on view at the museum over the winter. And we really enjoyed having that show as well. So Alyssa, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for hosting this talk and organizing it. Thank you to everyone at BMAC, uh, the whole team for pulling the show together. And um, I just wanna say thank you to Ted Holland at Herschel and Adler, who was, he was kind of the central point for bringing all these works together, um, as well as Louisa's friends and family who've been instrumental in kind of providing uh, information on Louisa since she passed away in 2016. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to speak with her. Um, so I will share my screen. Great. Yeah. Okay, great. So I just want to start with a couple of images of the exhibition for those of you who haven't seen it. This is the beginning of the show, which starts with Louisa's early work from around 1975. Um, and then I just have a shot from the, uh, the of the last portion of the show, which is her work uh, from the late, later part of her career. And we'll sort of work through some of the some of these specific objects um, throughout the talk. But I want to I want to start off by telling you how I came to this material. Um, Louisa Chase is not so well known today. She's an amazing artist. She enjoyed enormous popularity from the mid 70s to the mid 80s. But then she really fell off the radar in many ways. And I think that she could really be part of this movement to, I don't want to say resurrect, but just to bring more attention to some of the female artists who were working during the time period that she was working in, namely the 1970s, mid 1970s through the early 2000s. Um, and even 2010s. So I came to Louisa when I was working at Yale and the Yale University Art Gallery has these three works, which are actually ideal in kind of capturing Louisa's career. They're all from the same time period, more or less. They're all from the 1980s, but they show how she works across media. So at upper left, we have an etching, which is a type of print. Lower left is a drawing. And then on the right is a painting. This is actually a massive painting, um, but for, so the scale is off in this, in this image. But I think it can, this really shows um, Louisa's tendency towards natural forms, her interest in geometry, and then her interest in mark making. And we're going to kind of touch on all of these um, throughout the talk today. But um, I think I wanted, one of the things that's really drawn me to Louisa is her sense of isolation. And she had many friends, but I just 
pulled out these couple of quotes where she, in her diaries, uh, the one on the left reads, the sea, this is who I am closest to. Today, she barely whispers, surface like silk. Through the fog, I can barely see the buoy in the distance. The egret glides across the surface as though skating on the ice. The seagull's movements are so exposed next to her stillness. She is bound to change later. She just won't say when. And then on the right, we have a couple of quotes that are really just jotted down on little tiny pieces of paper. Um, sense of security in oneself or existential acceptance of a lack of self or kamikaze curiosity. And then below, what is needed to entertain disquiet as opposed to reaffirming one's concept of a sense of self in just simple, modest ways. Um, so just to kind of think about those quotes in relation to her work, I think Louisa was really interested in personal expression and she kind of balanced that with a sense of order. So there's sort of order and chaos um, that's combined in her works. And this is really drawing on the moment in which she's working, I think. And we're gonna come, we're gonna circle around to this in a moment, but just this idea that art can be a personal expression. Um, of one's emotions or one's thoughts is really at the center of her art making practice from the beginning. And it's coming out of abstract expressionism in many ways. Here's a Jackson Pollock on the left that all of you will probably recognize uh, on the right is a Mark Rothko. And so this idea of kind of immediate expression of you know, the individual emotions and thoughts is coming through this abstract expressionism that sort of is at its high in the 50s and even into the 60s, but by the early 70s, it's really started to wane. In the 60s, minimalism is kind of the other main trend in the art world. And it's very much the opposite of abstract expression. Minimalism is all about objectivity, um, a kind of absence of the artist and absence of the, sub the, the subjective. Um, it's interest, there's an interest in industrial materials in kind of very uh, smooth surfaces. You don't really see the artist's hand and geometry, a lot of geometric forms. And so Louise is kind of coming into the art world as minimalism is sort of starting to fade in some ways, as abstract expressionism is sort of starting to, to fade. And there's this movement that comes about, oh, well, she's working under Al Held at Yale. And Al Held is very much associated with abstract expressionism, but also is tapping into minimalism as we see in this this piece on the left that's monochromatic, very geometric, as opposed to his earlier work at top, which is much more expressionistic. And then in the bottom right is kind of classic later Al Held, which in many ways is kind of combining uh, these two trends of expression and minimalism. And Louise is kind of caught in this moment of post, what we call now post-minimalism. And um, here are a couple of works by various artists that Louise was in touch with in various ways or knew about. And I thought it would just be interesting and helpful to kind of put her within this context. So we have Nancy Graves on the left, also a Yale graduate, Ava Hesse at the top, and you can really see her working with these imperfect forms. You really get a sense of the artist's hand. Upper right is Philip Gustin's, uh, Philip Gustin drawing where he turns this iron into a sort of animate creature with eyes. Um, and that's really Gustin-like is this kind of playful animation of object objects. Um, and then on the bottom, we have a Mel Bachner floor piece uh, where he's working with stones, with these white stones, and he's thinking about their relations to one another, um, but also there's a sort of mathematical structure uh, that he doesn't, he doesn't quite explain, but seems to sort of be underlying it at the same time that he allows for chance. And so Mel Bachner is kind of in this really interesting realm in 1972, where he's kind of tap tapping into conceptual art. He's one of those kind of early conceptual artists um, but his work is, I think, very much tied to some of Louise's work, just in this interest in kind of chance and relationality between the different forms. So Louisa, when she's at Yale from 1973 to 1975, she is working under Al Held, technically doing painting, but a lot of her work is sculptural. So on the left, these are a couple of Christmas ornaments that kind of look like these 
toy objects she was making at the time. They were often on wheels. She would attach strings to them and pull them around. Um, it was really very playful and toy and toy like these wooden wooden objects she was making. At upper right, we can see this sculpture that she made out of vinyl. And this is just one of multiple sculptures she was making out of um, out of this material, they were sort of blown up, they could kind of move. Um, she would often kind of carry them with friends across campus and place them in various locations. And then at the bottom right, we see her kind of early, her early work that ended up going on view just before she graduated from Yale, which is really remarkable. She had a solo show at Artist Space, which was an emerging art gallery that's still around today in New York City. And she had the show of floor pieces. She called them floor paintings, which is really interesting. Uh, I don't know whether any of these exist today. Um, a couple of days ago, I would have said they don't exist. They only exist in photographs, but I found out yesterday that they might exist, um, which is really exciting when I haven't had a chance to follow up yet. But anyway, she's working with these floor pieces where we really get a sense of Louisa moving from the toy individual object into this realm of systems and relations and how these objects within her art relate to one another, how the balls relate to the X's, relate to these kind of arches. Um, and so we're gonna talk about, about some systems in a moment, but this is the work that she's kind of making at, at Yale. This is an early work from around the same time. And again, it kind of represents that toy-like moment. Here's a close-up just so you can see the amazing surface. Um, it's a little bit glossy. She's painted on this kind of white crack, which is really interesting. Um, and then she moves into this, this idea of a system. She's putting a spiral in conversation with these two little balls in the lower right in the the drawing on the right hand side here. And so it's no longer just about an individual form, but it's about how different forms relate to one another. Um, again, here's a close up just for those of you who are interested in how she's building up the surface um, from gra graphite to these different la layers of, of, um, of enamel paint. And so we already talked about this a little bit, but this piece is called Cars and Triangles. And again, we see these systems with these various cars, which are basically wooden cylinders on wheels, min, uh, moving through this space that is um, structured around these horizontal aluminum strips that are sometimes raised. And it's unclear what those, they, those kind of raised triangles, quote unquote, kind of morph in what they might evoke. So sometimes we get a car on top of them. And so they seem like a road that then has these elevations. Sometimes the cars are passing under them. So maybe they're an overpass or a tunnel. Um, so her work is kind of constantly morphing, even in, in, within an individual work of art like this one, the different forms within it morph and take on different meanings. Uh, so here's a close up of my favorite part of it, which is this one car that's essentially broken in half, which I think is very clever, clever. or maybe it's just flexible. Some people interpret it as broken, but maybe it's just a flexible car, um, the car of the future. Uh, so here's a monotype that Louisa made around the same time, which again shows her interested in systems and in space, even though this is a two dimensional two-dimensional surface, she's building up space by having these balls and rods or um, strips, uh, and then just these white outlines in places. And it's hard to, sometimes to tell what is going over what and what is going under what. Uh, she's really evoking the sense of layering and a buildup of space, but also of movement. You have all of these little folds, uh, what it look like folds. It's all two-dimensional. There's no three-dimensionality here, but she gives the illusion of things folding on top of one another, or underneath one another. Um, she also gives a sense of movement in, in the way she positions some of these colored balls. So for example, in kind of center right, you see these two balls next to each other that are half blue and half pink. And it's unclear whether they're two different balls or they're the same ball at two different moments in time, whether the ball has just moved over time, rotated to a new space. And that's the same thing that's happening with those white marks that we see in places. Sometimes they appear like they could be an, an outline or a shadow or a, a trace of where something previously lay and now is no longer there. 
Um, so it's really interesting how she's starting to think about time within these systems. Um, the one other thing, here's just a close up for those of you who are interested in how she's creating the different colors, um, including the white, which is literally just the, the canvas itself. This is printed on canvas. But the other thing I will mention is that even though these are enclosed systems, you can see that the objects are coming off the edges. And the edge and this whole question of boundaries and the edge was something Louisa was really interested in. She didn't really believe, she kind of believed that we could make the edges or the boundaries be wherever we wanted them to be. And I think that applied both in art and in life, um, <laughs> but that's just my interpretation of, of kind of her and her as a person. But that's definitely coming into play here is this is a system that is enclosed and it works in and of itself, but it also has the potential to, to expand. This is another work from the same period where she's building up this three dimensionality within her surfaces where the different objects within relate to one another. So you see, for example, this sort of blue and yellow grid on the left that's all kind of warped and wonky. Um, it's not as orderly as, for example, a minimalist might have it. It's definitely you know, more expressive and, um, and disorderly. And she's inserted this kind of object, this black and white object into it to create this sort of three dimensionality. If we look at the edges, we can really see how she's building up the surface. There's so much texture here. And so I think we could also think about the system as, an, as in terms of art making process itself. She literally is putting down a red layer, then an orange layer, then the blue and the yellow. I mean, it's a very systematic process um, that she's working through, even though it seems really spontaneous and expressive which it is, I mean, it's definitely expressive, but there's a, a meticulous to this work as well. In the early 80s, she really starts to think about incision um, or to use incision. So all of those kind of marks, those sort of brown, what look like brown marks, those are incised. So she's put down a brown layer of, um, of oil and then she's gone over it with green and she's like lifted some of the green to create these incised lines. So again, there's a sense of space. There's a sense of um, a sense of a, a relationality between these different motifs. But I think more important even than that is she's starting. She's thinking about the repetition of forms. You know, this ball that we see the two hands tossing in upper center that keeps coming back, and that's something that she really, really turns to. Um, right around this time period. So here, for example, she really takes the cavern as a motif and she works it over and over and over again. And Louisa herself would say, um, I'm looking for the quote, I have her quote right here. She said, the forces closest to the landscape are the closest to the internal forces that I'm trying to understand. The location is inside. So for her, feelings can take on can, can become visual symbols. She can express her, one can express one's feelings through visual symbols and through those visual symbols, communicate them to the spectator. And so she's no longer thinking about her art as a system that's enclosed and separate from the artist, separate from the viewer. But here she's really thinking about the relationship between the artist through the work to the spectator. Um, and so we become part of this part of her thinking in a way that I think in her earlier work, she's really not thinking as much about the spectator. It's much more about her expression and the artwork in and of itself. And I believe in my kind of theories in this time period, she's really starting to think more about how to express herself. It's interesting because in this time, she's really popular. I mean, this is the work on the right. This is the type of painting that gets her extremely well known through Bob Miller's gallery in the early 80s, the late 70s, early 80s. Um, through the mid 80s. And then in the late 80s, she has a falling out with Robert Miller, who was a very uh, prominent gallerist in New York City. And by 1991, she's relocated to Long Island. So this type of work is really before that. This is really kind of considered her, in many ways, her height, um, the height or her renown. And so, yeah, she's working through these, these motifs that are really symbolic and she varies them. So in the painting that we see on the right, the pink 
pink cavern or whatever we want to call it, I think is technically untitled. Um, we see these three different caves, you know, one of them has a light background, one of them has a sort of medium background, one of them has a dark background. And so the cave takes on different or the cavern takes on different forms. You know, the main large one seems more like maybe a um, an arch, uh, an archway where there's light on the other side, whereas the one in the upper right seems like a cap, like really like a cavern that you're entering into a mountain or something like that. Um, her surface is again amazing. And I think I have a close up here. We can just see her kind of reworking again. And there are lots of other forms in this um, that she's also, she's reusing feet, for example, or something that come up again and again. But here's a, just a, for those of you who are interested, her surface, you can see how she's building up these materials layer by layer. And then on the right, you can see how she's incising them. Um, so here, I just wanted to show her doing this in a different medium. So just to bring back the thunderstorm painting that's at Yale and to put it next to Cloudburst, which is a woodcut that she made in 1982. So we're still in the early 1980s, but just how her mode of expression, you know, can shift across media and to think about, you know, her painting process is very much one of layered and layering and repetition. Um, it's both spontaneous and very thought through and laborious in many ways, playful, and also it's hard work. Um, and that's similar to kind of the printmaking process, which again, every single color here would have required a different wood block. And she would have had to kind of carefully register them. Um, but she was trained in printmaking. She had trained during her BFA in printmaking and continued to make prints afterwards so she was she was clearly very adept at this but it's just interesting to me that you know in all of her desire for expressivity um the print was very much an art form that she considered and she used frequently even though it was you know a process that really required breaking down the image into component colors component parts in a way that other media don't require in quite the same way this is another series of prints called Solar Plate, which is a little bit more spontaneous, I think, um, than Woodcut, but it's called Five Fears. And again, we can really see how personal this is. It's probably her five fears. It's certainly not everyone's five fears. Again, it's all they're all natural. So who says the ants in the lower right are really represent, like maybe she's not afraid of ants, but maybe the ants represent something that she's afraid of. Um, and so there's all this kind of layered meaning that we can sort of speculate to, but we don't fully have a handle on. And I think that's something that Louisa starts to realize is the case around this time that she makes this portfolio, which is the, the, the early 2000s. I think she's starting to realize just how much visual and even verbal modes of communication are, you know, how ineffective they can be at times and how hard it can be to communicate with others. So here, for example, we see her moving from this representational realm into a more abstract realm. So on the left, we still have this element of symbolism where we can sort of discern that these colored shapes are boats. That red strip at the bottom coming off this drawing and then those two blue watercolor um, verticals, that, that represents a boat. And then at top, that you know yellow with the red coming off of it, that's another boat. And then in the middle, we have these really dynamic black uh, black ink marks. And so she's starting to think about the right around, I mean, these are around 1990, but 1990 through the early 2000s. Um, and even later, she's really thinking through the, the relationship between between representation and abstraction, and I think what it means to make a mark and to have that mark represent something. And so in a way, we can get as much from these black uh, scribbles, for lack of a better word, as we can from the boats. You know, they're very evocative of a particular kind of, you know, energy. Um, and we can associate them perhaps with certain kinds of emotions, but they're very dynamic and, and evocative, um, both emotionally and visually. And then on the right, you know, as she works through the boat very quickly breaks down, she breaks it down into these discrete geometric rectangles and squares. Um, and they're no longer tied to the boat form in the same way we wouldn't recognize them as boats, as you can see in the drawing on the right. So very much this, this moment of 1989 is a moment where she's thinking about the relationship between abstraction and representation and what it means to communicate in one versus in the other.
And this is an interest. Here's a close up just so you can see how she's layering these different materials. It's really interesting um, just to see her working with the graphite and then she comes in with the watercolor that goes over the edges. So there's a sort of imperfection, a chaos at the same time that there's an order. Um, this continues to be of interest to her in the coming decades. And here we see headstand, which is maybe my favorite piece in the show, because again, we get these like really dynamic marks. And then we have this figure that centers the whole composition and kind of stabilizes it of this headstand figure that's repeated in yellow, like this kind of deeper yellow in the center, and then a more diffuse yellow and larger you know, yellow form outside of that. And then you'll notice the red almost evokes another one of these headstand figures, and maybe even the black, if you look closely at times can sort of be seen to represent a headstand figure. And so it's this kind of nesting of different headstand figures <laughs> in varying from, you know, the most representational to the most abstract. Um, and then on the left, I think she's very cleverly put in these kind of sketches of this composition. And so she's really showing us the process of not just painting her, you know, work process, but also this process of moving from representation to abstraction. And it literally comes off the page. It has a sort of explosive energy, which I find really, um, really beautiful and gripping. Here's a close up just so you could see her brushwork. Uh, she's making drawings at this period. Um, there are hundreds of drawings. She was known for making hundreds of drawings in a night sometimes. Um, it was her, I think her primary mode of expression um, and very much a spontaneous mode. She didn't have to layer quite as much. She didn't have to wait for paint to dry as much. Um, she didn't have to, you know, press, make and press different wood blocks or whatever. She didn't have to work with different print materials. Uh, Right around 2000, like in the late, in the first decade of the 2000s, kind of at the end of the first decade of the 2000s, she turns to language, verbal language, uh, and starts to investigate how communication can work through visual language. Again, she's still thinking about us, very much thinking about the communication from an individual to a spectator. At this point, she's in Long Island. Um, this is around the time where she's talking about um, she's talking about feeling closest. Oh, actually, this is after she's closest to the landscape, but she really isolates herself in, in Long Island, and she has a community there. But I do think there's something potentially biographical about how she's thinking about communication and how we communicate um, just in terms of her own her own life at this point. Um, but anyway, in this piece and in many others that she made that are like it. She is working through language and what it means for language to be legible or illegible. And this question of whether the word alone and legibility of the word, like two in the upper left, you know, is that all we need for to get to communicate or do we need something more than that? So the two, when it stands alone, doesn't really mean much to us, right? We don't really know the context. And so there's very little we can gain from that. Um, in a way, these kind of scribbling marks that we can't read are almost more expressive than that word we can read. And I think that's part of what she's playing with here is what does it mean to isolate a word from a sentence or what does it mean to literally do these, make these scribbles that have so much energy and power um, and, and communicative power even though they don't make actual words. Another thing I wanted to draw your attention to here was this grid that she's made in graphite that she's expanding beyond, she's moving beyond. So again, this question of boundaries, um, which I think comes back to this idea of a system and what it means to work within a system versus to break out of it and beyond it. Or we could think about that in terms of what it means to be an individual and what it means to relate to people outside of us and how we can do that. And this is the final, the final work in the show, which is called Buddha. Um, it's from 2011. And here she brings, she reintegrates the scribbling line with this geometric form. And to me, I kind of see this as the epitome of this combination of abstract expressionism or some form of expressionism and minimalism or some kind of post-minimalist inclination that she has because we see these scribbles and they kind of swirl around this Buddha figure in the center, uh, you know, in Buddha pose. Um, 
And there is a both a spatial dimension, there's also a temporal dimension, there's a movement at the same time that there's a stability, there's a core. And so I think, again, there's this question of order and chaos, or we could think of these this juxtaposition in so many ways. Um, we could think of it as development versus maintenance or stasis. And again, I think this has to do with the whole question of the self and changeability versus stability or changeability versus endurance and who we are as people and how we communicate and relate to the world around us. She made this piece just five years before she passed away in 2016 um, after seven years of battling cancer. Uh, but and I think this piece really shows her trying to balance this idea of kind of peace, <laughs> peace at the same time that there's this disquiet to kind of come back to the word she used in one of those initial quotes we looked at. And just to end, oh, here's a, yeah, here's a close up just so you can see the brushwork again and how she cuts off her brushes and her marks and, and layers them. It's really remarkable. But then I just wanted to end with this final quote by her that I think is, it's a poem that she wrote that I think is really, really beautiful and really uh, taps into this I, this question about isolation uh, versus being part of a community uh, or feeling part of a community. She says, let me live in the house by the side of the road where the race of men go by, the men who are good and the men who are bad, as good and as bad as I. I will not sit in the scorner's seat or carry the cynic's fan. Let me live in the house by the side of the road and be a friend to man. And I just think that really captures, that poem really captures her desire to both be a part of um, a community or you know, the race of man at the same time as she recognized that she was an individual um, in, that was you know, by the side of the road that was also kind of watching from afar or you know, absorbed within a sort of sense of self, but yet a disquiet sense of self. So that's, um, that is my overview. Thank you all. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you that you might have. Oh, thank you, Alyssa. That was wonderful. Um, really great to go through and have her work in, in context like that and then go through kind of the progression of her career. Um, thank you so much. And for those of you who are on Zoom, again, you can use the Q&A or the chat function and Facebook Live, you can use the comment box there. Um, so feel free to ask any questions you might have. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the title of the exhibit, Fantasy Worlds, and um, just that idea. I think we got to it a little bit in the, in the presentation, but if you could just maybe elaborate on that concept. Sure, I think that relates a lot to her earlier work. I think it relates less to her later work um, mm -hmm. as I've come to kind of see it. I also think if I were to go back, I'd rename it Fantastic or Fantastical Worlds because in her diaries, she actually makes a distinction between fantasy and the fantastic or fantastical. Although I don't fully understand yet what that distinction is. Um, so I have to do more reading on her to figure that out uh, or actually more on her contemporaries to figure that out. But I, she, her early work, she sees those, especially those sculptures and some of those earlier toy works as the, as a way of kind of creating a miniature world or actually as miniature worlds. And I sort of was using the term system in this talk, but I think another way we could think about it is as a world. I mean, literally a system as a world or a world as a system, an enclosed system. Um, and then the fantasy comes in just with the imagination. I mean, she was so creative and imaginative and for her objects were animate um, in a way. And she kind of wanted them to be animate, those balls, the, the very Gustin-like approach to, to the object. She really wanted them to kind of jump off of the, out of the sculpture or off of the wall. You know, it was all about trying to animate these forms or to imagine them animated. So one of my interests with Louisa is her early work and this idea of play and games um, and her shift from the toy to the game, this kind of individual toy to a kind of collection of, of to toys that might constitute a game. Uh, and so that's kind of where the title was, was coming from. That's great. I, I love that how playful the, the work in the, the exhibit um, is. And it was nice to hear that that's, like part of part of your thinking too with it that's um 
it's really it's so engaging like I bring students through and it's it's um, really like bright and engaging and accessible and um, and fun it's a really fun exhibit (laughs) (laughs) her work is fun she talks about it in terms of games it's really it's really fun to read her diaries too that's great yeah so uh, do you have her diaries through through her friends so Syracuse University mm-hmm. has her diaries and I wasn't able to see them before the show went up um, but I was sent digital copies through some an amazing person at Syracuse um, nice. and yeah I think anyone I think it would probably be accessible to anyone who went to Syracuse University but that's where she did her BFA so that's where the diaries ended up. Nice. Um, Andy asked, uh, do you get a sense of Louise's personality through your research? Yeah, absolutely. This has actually been a huge question with this project. She was an extremely strong personality. She was very cute, very charismatic, very dynamic, very personable, but also extremely strong, strong willed. Um, and I can imagine she was probably quite funny. Um, but yeah, there's a very strong sense of personality that comes through the diaries and also in talking to her friends. And a major question for me in this research has been how much I want to bring her her personality, her biography into it. Um, Andy oh. said, I knew yeah. her from well, I would be curious to hear more from you. But yeah, that's been a major question for me because, you know, I think especially when you're working with women artists, it's really challenging to kind of talk about biography and personality as as related to their work. Um, it just takes on a whole nother layer of meaning, especially with an artist who's so expressive. It's so, so much of her work really is about personal expression. So much of it is about this feeling of isolation or even loneliness that kind of contrasts with, with the persona she put on externally. And that's something that I think you know, it's it's hard not to kind of put a feminist read on that and to think about her working in this context of male, a male dominant dominant art world. Um, Yale was certainly male dominant at the time. All of her mentors were male dominated or were male. Um, she had a lot of female friends, but you know, my inclination is always to kind of read something to kind of put a feminist read on that, and I've been hesitant to do that because it's such a because she didn't identify as a feminist. But yeah, her personality is definitely, definitely comes across, especially in her diaries, which are extremely funny. Um, There have been times where I've been reading them on the train and, you know, she'll talk about this man who talks so much he could talk to a pole. I mean, she's just, she's very clever. Uh, Yeah. Um, I was wondering, as you were talking about, um, like, the, the sense of movement in the, in the, in the pieces, there's, they almost want you to like dance with them or pose with them like the headstand and the buddha pose there's a lot of um like her physical gestures in the mark making that you can see like you can it's you can kind of tell that she was right-handed like from the from the mark making and then um and then yeah and then the the pieces themselves the content of them is evocative of movement as well Yeah, definitely. And I think part of that is she wanted the objects themselves to have a sense of movement and animation. And part of it is very much kind of her full body experience in making the work. Some of it's really large and some of it's really small. It's really interesting. She works across so many media and so many different scales and sizes. So yeah, she's just enormously, it's enormously diverse, her work. And I think that gesture and animation is definitely a huge part of it. Even when she's really meticulously kind of layering the different, you know, different paint layers or print layers, and she still manages to get this really expressive brushstroke um, that really animates the surface. So I think that's definitely a part of a part of her work. And again, I think it's this idea of change and mutability. I mean, that was a big thing for a lot of artists at that time um, was this idea of of mutability, um, which again kind of pushed back against the minimalist approach, which was very static. Mm, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, good. I think those are all the the questions that I see here. Um, but I this was such a wonderful talk and um, really nice for me. I've been giving tours of the the exhibit, and it's so nice to hear this additional context and kind of insight into her diaries. So thank you so much for bringing this work to the museum and for 
sharing uh, like a peek into your process as well. This was a wonderful talk. Well, thank you so much for having the show and for having me this evening. Yeah, of course. And for um, anyone who's joining us, please come to the museum and see this exhibit in person. We're open Wednesday to Sunday, 10 to 4, and admission is pay as you wish. And it'll be up through June 12th. And the catalog is available. I put the links in the chat. Um, there's the blog post and the virtual tour as well if you're not able to make it to the show. So I think well that we'll we'll close it out. We had another, we had a comment um, from Lisa who said, thanks for the great talk. So uh, thanks, Lisa. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, great. All right. Well, thanks, Alyssa. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.